Really what was that? That what? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I have a lot of patience. <laughs> Okay, so we should probably get started. Um, sorry for the delay, guys. I really uh, appreciate your patience. Um, but uh, so my name is John Gutierrez. Uh, I'm director here at the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies. It's nice to welcome you all uh, to our first uh, Summer Fellows uh, Showcase. Um, we've been uh, awarding summer travel fellowships uh, for years here at the, at the Clackles. Um, and we know anecdotally um, that those investments in our students um, have uh, yielded a lot of returns. Um, but this year we decided to do something different, which was uh, to provide our grantees an opportunity to share um, some of the research that they were able to conduct, thanks in part to the fellowship, um, with the broader GC community. So today is the first and not the last uh, of these um, Summer Fellows uh, showcases. Um, for the entire day, this room um, will be featuring the work of, um, of our fellows um, as one of the reviewers of, uh, of the applications. It's nice to see uh, the actual work product after um, reading your, um, your applications uh, many, many months ago. So, um, there's a lot going on. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say about this program in particular, and, and I'm going to hand this off to my colleague, Kathy Cabrera, um, is that um, this event was put together uh, almost entirely by our uh, student staff. Um, and so they are going to be taking a leadership role throughout the day uh, in highlighting your work and uh, keeping the program going, including um, the technological piece, which is very, very difficult. Um, anyway, um, thanks for being here. Um, we're looking forward to, to hearing your work. Uh, thank you all for agreeing to participate. Um, and uh, let's have a successful day. Thanks. Bye. Uh, buenos dias, good morning. Bienvenidos, my name is Katy Cabrera Figueroa. I am a PhD student in history and the social media director for the Center for Latin American, Caribbean and Latino Studies at the CUNY Graduate Center. That's a mouthful, so we're also known as CLACLs. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2023 CLACL Summer Research Fellows Showcase. Um, I was looking for how far back CLACLS has been awarding its summer fellowships to PhD students, and the last file I found was labeled Summer Fellows Pre-2013. That's a long time, but not surprising since CLACLS always put graduate students front and center. This entire showcase, as John mentioned, was put together by our student research fellows, from our graphics coordinator Juan Acevedo's gorgeous signage, to all the logistics and planning done by Fatima Velez and Diomar Garibas. Even the selection process for our summer research fellowship includes student input. Research fellows at CLACLs review applications along with faculty select finalists for the summer fellowship. CLACLs is a student-centered space. Our office, room 5419, please remember that number, <laughs> has students from various fields who study different regions in Latin America. If you have an idea you want to collaborate on or need help with logistics, let us know. We may be able to help. Most importantly, we are a space where you will find camaraderie. That is a really hard word for me to say as a first generation student, <laughs> so I practice it all the time. Also, as social media director, I have to say, follow us, like our post, share our stories. Gracias, thank you for joining us today, and we will now begin our 2023 fellowship showcase. So I wanna introduce Fatima Velez so we can begin. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for your uh, words. Uh, let's see if this works. Um, okay. Um, so I'm going to introduce our fellows. Uh, so uh, the first um, is going to be Victoria Furtado Alonso. Uh, Victoria is a PhD student in the Latin American, Iberian, and Latino cultures program 
uh, from the Graduate Center uh, CUNY. Uh, she's a BA in Linguistics and MA in Human Sciences. Uh, her concentration is language, culture, and society. Uh, she studied at the Universidad de la República de Uruguay, and her interests are sociolinguistics, discourse analysis, feminisms, language and gender, social movements, and ethnography. Um, then we have Andrea Arisa Garcia, who is a PhD candidate in the critical sociolinguistics track of the uh, LILAC depart um, uh, department uh, at CUNY. Uh, she is an adjunct, le ad adjunct lecturer in the Department of Anthropology uh, in CUNY and Queens College. Her research explores the confessional practices in witchcraft, sorcery, and superstition crimes prosecuted by the Holy Office of the Mexican Inquisition as a performative act that constitutes the genderized and racialized subject of otherness. Her academic practice is founded in a interdisciplinary and the colonial approach to the production and consumption of knowledge. Her research interests are woman and gender studies, critical race theory, cultural and linguistics anthropology, historical materialism, the colonial studies, archival theory, and art history. Mm, Natasha uh, is a poet, a scholar, and literary translator her research focuses on Latin American disabilities, uh, queer disabilities, and sound in Latin American cultural productions. And she has a web page uh, that is natashatiniacos.com. Um, last but not least, uh, Mauricio, who is joining us by Zoom, uh, he, Mauricio Roberto Diaz Garcia, he is a Guatemalan archaeologist a student of the Department of Anthropology. He has worked uh, excavating and analyzing archaeological materials from different Mayan cities in Guatemala and Honduras, Central America. Uh, his research interest is Maya ceramics. Uh, through it, he seeks to understand the people who created, used, and discarded the shirts he analyzes. As a Guatemalan of mixed heritage, to study the archaeology of his region is to study his own past. The indigenous past in Guatemala has been systematically denied. Studying it and reconnected with that past is more necessary than ever. So welcome to the first panel uh, that we call Bodies in Resistance for obvious reasons. Um, so Victoria, you have the work. Um... Pero funciona. No, pero ahora. O si quieres, me vas diciendo y yo te lo, te lo paso. Sí. So my presentation, th thank you for being here. My presentation is Knowledge Production and Transmission in the Contemporary Uruguayan Feminist Movement. Uh, in this presentation, I share some advances of a project that aims to investigate the autonomous processes of knowledge production and political education that occur in Latin American feminist movement. 
At the present stage, the question that guides my work is how the collectives that are part of the contemporary feminist movement in Uruguay generate strategies for registry, systematization, and transmission of the experience of struggle. For this purpose, with the support of the CLAC Summer Fellowship, I collected different types of documents produced by collectives in two cities of the country, Montevideo and Maldonado. You have them you on the map. Um, this allowed me to form an initial corpus for my research composed for about 20 texts, as well as some secondary materials. In this paper, I focus on four of them in order to analyze the production processes, the textual genres use, and to reflect about the importance of documenting the experience of struggle through autonomous editing and publishing. Celia Federici says that the moments in which feminism are not in the street in a massive way are moments of construction. In particular, she claims that political education is an essential task because it's part of the infrastructure of social mov movements. At present, Latin American feminism are creating collective and autonomous projects dedicated to documenting the experience of struggle, to political education, and to the production of situated knowledge. This is done in many ways, workshops and schools, editorial and translation projects, different kinds of publications, militant research, and so on. All this is done in a collective, as a collective task through numerous and creative experimentations. This is not something new for the feminist movement. Sandra Mohanty states that feminist uh, practices operate on at least three levels, the everyday constitution of identities and communities, the collective actions towards social transformation, and the production of knowledge through the theory, pedagogy, and creative textual activity of feminist studies. My reflection points to this last level of practices, but unlike Mohanty, I focus on the movement itself. With this, I do not intend to create a dichotomy between academia and activism, since although they are different social spaces, the people who participate in one another in Latin America are often the same. My point here is that I believe it is relevant to give an account of the initiatives carried out by the movement own organizations and collectives, since the feminist struggle has a strong intellectual and pedagogical dimension. My research focuses on contemporary feminism. In Uruguay, we can place them in the period from 2014 to the present. Uh, so I use this criterion for the collection of the corpus. Based on previous research on the feminist movement, I choose the cities of Montevideo and Maldonado for being both places where the feminist movement has had a sustained presence during the period considered. Even so, the scales are very different. Montevideo is the capital and the largest city of the country. Maldonado is an intermediate-sized city located on the Atlantic coast with an important economic activity linked to tourism. Initially, I collected about 20 documents self-published uh, by collectives in both cities. After a review, I exclude publications that are only anthologies or compilation of texts and photo books. I have some of those documents here in case you want to take a look because they are beautiful. Uh, although the later the photo books are an interesting archive of the feminist struggle, in this opportunity I'm not working with multimodal or multisemiotic analysis tools that will allow me to approach them. I did include documents of various kinds, scenes, books, booklets, booklets who focuses to serve as materials for political education, the documentation of experience of the struggle or the production of new knowledge. Uh, follis, following this criteria, I delimited a corpus of 14 documents for my research. In this paper, I will present an exploratory analysis of four of, this, of these documents. Their main focus is to document the experiences of struggle beyond the fact that they can also be used for instances of political education or that militant research strategies have been used for their creation. The documents are, uh, you have the list on, on the slide, uh, Juntas, Escrituras de Mujeres y Disidencias en Experiencias Colectivas, published by uh, Biblioteca Popular Villa García, Colectivo Liberta and Espacio Cultural Biblio Barrio. 
then Mujeres por la Vida Digna, Tejiendo Feminismos desde Abajo, uh, by, published by Minerva, uh, Recreo Feminista, published by the Comisión de Mujeres de ADES, que es el Sindicato de Profesores de Educación Secundaria, and uh, Resonancias Somos Marea, 8M 2022, published by Que uh, Arda in Maldonado. The contents of these documents are collected, planned, are created through different strategies, sometimes exclusive, sometimes combined. Invitation or open calls to individuals and collectives to participate in the publication with their text, compilation of manifest and other documents already written but uncirculated, selection of texts by feminist authors of reference, texts created for the publication that give an account of the history or experience, Uh, of the edi editing collective, production of articles for the publication, and so on. The process of production, editing, and circulation of this, these registers of the experience of struggle is linked to other practices of the feminist movement. For example, the contents are often arise from activities, writing workshops, podcast production, or political projects carried out by the collectives. Or the other times the documents are created for later use in political education activities. And of course, they are also linked to the public uh, political practices of the movement in the street. Manifestos, declarations, and individual or collective accounts of March 8 mobilizations are other and other key dates are also documented. This includes reports of the processes of political articulation and organization prior to this demonstration. The process of production, ed editing, and circulation of this document allow allows us to see the many levels on which feminist collectives create complicities. The militants often use the metaphors of, of weaving, weft, or fabric to talk about the movement. But where are the threads that make up this feminist fabric? The way in which the experience of struggle is documented as shared show us some of them. Uh, the collectives invite others to collaborate with text or go in search of their experiences. On, other, uh, on the other hand, there are some experiences of collective organized product publications. In addition, it is a common practice that the public presentations of scene or books are instances of exchange with other collectives that are invited to comment on the materials. Um, The definition, this distinction, and the limitation of discursive, literary, and textual genres is a matter long discussed by linguistics, literary studies, and other related disciplines. I don't have time to address this discussion here, uh, but what is pertinent to note, however, is that the corpus of documents defies all classification attempts and existing typologies. The textual activity of feminism is characterized by heredity and collage. Just in the four documents that I selected for this presentation, we have uh, we find narrative texts, essays, short story, chronicles, personal or collective tales, poems, songs, manifestos, press statements, pamphlets, chronologies, theoretical artic articles, research articles. Every texts are also abundant. Fiction, autofiction, and nonfiction are all present. Individual or collective voices are combined. Um, in general, all documents also include uh, pictures of mobiliza mobilization and feminist action. In addition, there are collage, uh, illustration, and other, other artistic expressions. Uh, all this shows the creativity that is always displayed in moments of struggle, but also shows a strong expressive need. It's not enough with a genre, a format, a textual type. It is necessary to make us of everything that is available, and what the most What does not exist is invented because there is much to say and is crucial to do so. Documenting the experience of a broad and intense social struggle requires the use of multiple resources. This task has been identified as necessary by the collectives and has been undertaken with determination and creativity. The reason mentioned for doing so are many, but two stand out. First one, to systematize the what has been done so far in order to continue thinking and doing together, and second, to leave a record of the struggle so that what has been achieved 
will not be forgotten and will be useful for others in the future. Um, therefore, the publication of these documents can be thought as a milestone in feminist temporality. It organizes a reading of the past, traveled up to the present, and projects this experience toward the, a future temporality. Uh, the intergeneration trans intergenerational transmission of the experience and the construction of one, um, one own voice to tell the story are two issues that emerge from this explorative work and on which I would like to deepen my analysis in the future. Thank you, Victoria, for this uh, powerful presentation and beautiful. So now, um, Andrea, you have. Hello. That works. It works. No. Okay, it's okay. I'll you let me know. Okay, perfect. Hello, thank you for being here. Um, so my presentation is going to be more about the process of being in the archive of how, but also I will bring a little bit of the research that came out of that. Um, so in general, my dissertation project, which is <laughs> beginning, right, um, explores uh, the fictionalization processes in forced confessional practices in which witchcraft cases prosecuted by the Mexican Inquisition between the 17th and the 18th centuries <clears throat> as constitutive part of the modern subject of otherness. Um, the Clackles Summer Fellowship allowed me to spend one month of intense um, archival ethnography at the Archivo General de la Nación in Mexico City and this is actually the second time that Clunkles is um, contributing to, to my um, archival research. Um, this is the third <clears throat> time um, that I am at the Archivo General de la Nación, and it was a very probably the most important um, research trip that I made until now. Um, yeah, because getting your way in an archive is something that needs time and a lot of encounters with the archive. Um, so, El Archivo General de la Nación um, is in the northeast uh, part of Mexico City and is known in popular court culture as the Black uh, Palace of Lecumberri. Um, also, it served as a penitentiary from the beginning of the 20th century until 1976. Also, as you can see, the design, well, we'll go to the previous one, yeah. The design uh, is said to be based on that of Jeremy Bentham's uh, Panopticon. Um, and I think it's very interesting, right, that I am looking at inquisition, controlling every movement of people, beliefs, practices uh, that are related to what is conceived as witchcraft, as a crime. And then I am in a space where all these documents are in a, yeah, in an architectural structure that is a panopticum of surveillance and so yes um the repository of the mexican inquisition at the archivo general de la nacion uh, contains uh, 1773 volumes between the 1522 to um, 1819 um however uh, um, only no, however, most of, of, of the volumes are not able to be consulted physically because of the bad state of the, yeah, of the matter. Um, so 64% of them are microfilm. And this is very important for my research because as you can see in the picture here is the inside of the archive, former prison, and each one of these little rooms and cells um, are uh, where the microfilm um, um, apparatus uh, machines are um, hosted, um, obviously because it provides um, darkness, right? Like it's a dark place where you can see a projection of the film. And so I have spent a long time in a cell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, working on this, and that's the next the next picture. Yeah. Um. So here you have me uh, smiling with the documents, and then I'm also in the in the little backyard having a break. And I did also. I was able to touch. Uh, well, not touch because latex gloves and all that. But but I but I was able to to consult physical um, volumes, which is a whole different experience. Um. Yes. The next one. Um, also something that I did that was very interesting during this month is that, um, while I was waiting for the documents that take a very long time when you order them to arrive, um, I went to the computers that the archive had and they have a repository of a, yeah, a repository that is called Mapilu, which I think the name is lovely. Um, and it means maps, bueno, mapas, planos e ilustraciones. Um, and then um, I found like a new door to <laughs> a lot of documentation, uh, beautiful uh, things, um, it, it, illustrations um, that, yeah, that I think is is probably like a new new thing that I'm going to be doing. Uh, this picture that you see here actually is a drawing um, of in a love letter from the 16th century. And actually the little person drawn is um, the lover um, of the writer of the of the um, letter. And then the next one. Um, and also there there is a lot of uh, maps mm -hmm. and I'm like obsessed right now with cartography. And I, yeah, it's so, so beautiful, these abstractions. And I don't know yet what to do with it, but I think this trip, was very important to it discovered like a new world to me but coming back to my research I mean obviously Mapilu was like like um, procrastinating and you know like running away from my own research but my research uh, obviously I looked at um, as much as I could um, I consulted as much as I could um, of processes of witchcraft um, but also reports or denuncias, uh, different um, formats of this documentation, of, the, of this information. I managed to gather 122 cases, uh, which is quite a lot. And I don't know how to start with it right now and paleograph and all this. But out of these uh, 122, I took, yeah, we can go to the next one. I, I uh, found three cases that described in detail flying rituals. Um, so during September, I wrote um, an article that has been submitted to the Women's Studies Quarterly from the Feminist Press at CUNY. So let's see, I hope that that's, that works. <laughs> um, but basically this research uh, explores the narrated images of uh, rituals for flying in three witchcraft procedures of the Mexican Inquisition as part of the bureaucratic mass production of otherness. These highly embodied practices denaturalize the modern subjectivizing dichotomies, critically interrogating the category of the human and challenging human animal monster boundaries imposed by Western epistemic colonialism. Interpreted through the Benjaminian concept of constellation, these procedures illuminate each other, showing the tropes of monstrosity for the metaphorical constitution of gender and race. The colonial narration of the flying rituals practiced by different women of the 8th, 17th and 18th century in colonial Mexico exposed the embodied production of otherness, where the instrumentalization of the monster unveils a semiotic artifact that derives in a multiplicity of forms. Through the theorizations of Sylvia Winter, Cristeva, and Moraña, this article examines the gender nexus of the constitution of the other, object, entity, and monster that only exist in language. I'm going to read as well, not yet, sorry, we can go, yeah. I will tell you. <laughs> I'm going to read just to end just the introduction so to show you a little bit more what this research is about. Um, so in 1749, Maria Jose Fairuegas and more than 20 women were accused of sorcery and pact with the devil by the Mexican Inquisition. The testimonies and confessions of the procedures described the embodied processes required to fly that consisted of a smearing and ointment of viper sebum blended with coal, sulfur, and musk, and sticking feathers of domestic birds in their bodies. 
While trying to figure out the visual representation of this fictionalized embodied practice, a dear friend of mine brought to my attention the work of Anand Mendieta, Bird Run, a film made in Mexico now we can go. in 1974, where her body is covered with feathers. Diving in the art of Mendieta, I found other bird theme pieces that helped me think about the processes of objection and resignification. While the Mexican Inquisition was creating an image of monstrosity, Mendieta explores the interstice between person, animal, male, female, flesh, and feather. Complicating the rigid dichotomies that produced the institutionalized monolithic bodies through race, gender, and sexual hierarchies. I realized that the association of these transhistorical images distanced by centuries, practices, and intentions revealed the emergence of a process of resignification of the abject entity in other times created to legitimize the disciplinary violences of the colonial regime. This investigation aims to be part of that process of resignification, where the monster is conceived as a nexus beyond hierarchies between animal, human, um, cultural, natural, assuming contradiction and paradox, giving form to the impossible in a fluid and ambiguous movement and containable, exceeding categories and models, allowing for a radical reading of the colonial archive that shifts the focus to the instruments of the bureaucratic mass production of otherness. Well, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good morning. Can you hear me well? Well, it's a small, well, it's not a small room, but I hope I'm going to read this short um, anecdotal, but also that says that this is a work in progress and hopefully with more uh, fellowships, I will continue. <laughs> it's, it's, I went to the Gloria Evangelina and Saldua papers in Texas. Over, oops, sorry. <laughs> Over the summer of 2023, I went to the University of Texas, Austin, to work on Gloria Evangelina Saldua, who that was born in 1942 and died from diabetes com complications in 2004. Uh, and the archive is called, or the collection is called Gloria Evangelina Saldua Papers. They are all in the Natty Lee Benson Latin American collection. I took so many pictures, but sadly, I cannot share it with you unless we grab a coffee and we, you know, I share my computer. But I'm going to, to try to narrate something quite specific um, that is like the root of my interest to her. Uh, I can show you the door of the collection, though. That's the door. <laughs> <laughs> and you might know it's one of the biggest, vast collections of Latin America in the world. I think there's one in Berlin. Big's work. Um, well, thanks to this fellowship by Clax, thank you so much for the support. I, I was able to, to go there, to move my body there. First, a personal note, because I'm a political asali and I don't have a passport, my research must be done on archives inside the States. Um, well, my doctoral research focuses on representations and agency of disability and illness in Latin American cultural product. I became interested in Gloria and Saldua to expand my concentration and generate a comparative approach uh, for in my future dissertation. I went there to find evidence of Anne Saldua's expressions of her bodily differences. More specifically, her experience with diabetes in tandem with her lesbian and Chicano identity. Her repository is vast, extending over 128 linear feet, and also the digital files are 7,000. I went daily for a week to review all the folders I could embrace in time. I requested and, bore and browsed a total of 16 boxes and 61 folders. The collection was a donation, and they also purchased something and was processed by Carla Alvarez, who kindly guided me when I was there. 
Before my arrival, I knew I wanted to consult the folders related to her diabetes. While preparing for my trip, I browsed the Texas Archival Resources online. It's a website. and listed the boxes and folders that caught my attention. In the inventory title, personal and biographical, there is a box called health and diet information, which holds her diabetes information, her diabetes tracking logs, some folders about alternate medicine, healing information, documents from doctors, handwritten notes, handwritten recipes. There is a lot of recipes in that archive uh, and many other things. That was my starting point. I had no idea what I would encounter. That's how we go to an archive, right? The first folder I opened was a thick, a thick folder containing some of her diabetic logbooks. Those logbooks, um, that's me <laughs> taking notes that I cannot show you either, but at least as a corner. Uh, that's all the things I consulted, but I'm gonna stop here. This is a generic example of what I saw, but there were so many. Uh, these logbooks were plenty, written by Han. She specified the hour of the day of her injection and what she ate and if something triggered or affected her. I read all her logbooks, all of them. And what I can share today is that what seems like a mechanical method that at moments was quite compre comprehensive. For example, she would write her blood sugar levels at various times on different days and include annotations of exercise, like how long she walked, if she didn't exercise, uh, what she ate, food, carbs, if she ate any sweet, and affections, how was she feeling, if something was hurting her. Um, also, being the lack of sleep or little sleep was one of the most common affections in that part of the logbook. As I progress in my reading, I noticed that in the notes sections of these small logbooks, she will annotate when her friends visit her. And if that friend had at the same time any physical discomfort of affection. I interpret this as her keeping track of her blood sugar also was permeated, permeated by other annotations of her body, how her body responded to her people, to her network of care, and also how her network of care, because I'm coming from a critical disability perspective, how they were also affected in their body. For me, her diabetes logbook is a method for understanding. Gloria Saldu identified herself as a Chicana dyke feminist Tejana Patlache poet. She was a scholar, poet, and author. Her seminal book, Borderlands La Frontera, The New Mestiza, published in 1984, written in English, Spanish, and Nahuatl, delves into the fluid, fluidity of borders. It is not a minor detail how she described the border, una herida abierta, an open wound. Not only the, the physical US-Mexican border, but the one between prose, poetry, and languages. The alternation of languages in her book echoes her bodily affections written in those love books and in several pieces of handwriting I read where she described how she was feeling. Her body was in flux in several aspects, in the physical border that she called the boon as a queer woman, as well as her experience with diabetes. Her work is about recognizing feelings of exclu exclusion while being expected to, to be fully immersed or assimilated, and I want to understand how she was expected to be assimilated by a normative society. In the folder, Diabetes General Info, I encounter a plethora of brochures and newspaper clips. Many of these news clips were hopeful for the fight against diabetes. One clip from the LA Times, dated May 31, 1996, is repeated. It's called Diabetes Study Finds a Way to Reduce Complications. This repeated clip has a, a handwritten note that says in blue ink, Gloria, great news, love, Che. This news clip was given to her by Cherry Moraga. So we can see this handwritten note in the accumulation of materials about her experience with diabetes also um, 
her network of, of affection and friends. In some of the flyers and brochures about diabetes, she, del she highlighted the phrase, your diabetes is out of control. There is also a printed, a printed guy that says, safe sex guidelines for women at risk of AIDS transmission. Herbs, guides, recipe invented by her mother, astrological information as well. I also browsed some of her correspondence folders and I read what she received from, from the Graduate Center. Her dialogue with Adrian Rich got my attention. In a letter, Rich tells right after her hospitalization not to waste time applying to the Guggenheim. She adds, they give almost no fellowship to women. The purpose of her letter is to discuss Ansaldúa's intention of using this fellowship, Guggenheim, and the poem Ansaldúa submitted to the magazine Sister Wisdom that Rich edited, that said, health is at the beginning and at the end of this letter. She closed by saying that after the surgery, she's 75% better and gaining in strength and hope. This is Adrian Rich in her letter. I infer there was a dialogue between their shared experiences of pain and illness and exclusion, which is part of life. Rich also comments on the US medical system. She says, quote, I still feel bruised from three weeks in that world. There was a cop close quote. There was a copy of Ansaldua's response in the same folder, which is quite unique because usually if you don't read what she wrote, these are gone in another archives. In this response, she starts by, by saying to Rich, Beth tells me this is a, the last free of pain that you have been in a long time, and I'm so glad. She tells Rich that she wrote about 20 minutes that she died in a hospital in her text that is called La Serpiente. She also comments that she made a curandera in San Antonio. I'm going to close. I also had time to photograph some of her manuscripts. That's, that's the, the core. For the study of the material I gather, I will shed light into this um, exclusion she faced, but I will center my reading in the interpretation of her relationship with her body in flux, her differences and affections, and the agency this claimed in her life and work. I am certain there will be issues of ableism uh, to be discovered here or to be interpreted, uh, also about her she, can ex her she can experience and everything about imposed by a normative society. Uh, of course, it, it also deserves a study from, from the analytical tool of post-humanism, like you're mentioning, you no, know, because I think as Aldua should be considered as a human and something else. And I look forward for your support to going back to this encyclopedic archive. Thank you very much. Uh, Mauricio, uh, hi. Hola. Hi. Eh. Puedes compartir tu pantalla, por favor. Claro que sí. Eh, dame un segundito. Muy bien, creo que. So, yeah, can you see it? Yes. Ah, perfecto. Well, uh, thanks for this fellowship. I was able to, well, spend about a month visiting uh, this Maya village in Guatemala. It is called uh, Chinautla. I am an archaeologist and my research, my PhD uh, dissertation is focusing on ceramics, Maya ceramics from a site in uh, East uh, Western Honduras. Uh, and I try to understand resilience of a community uh, dated about uh, 980. Um, and what can we learn from just ceramics and apply uh, all this knowledge to resilience of indigenous communities? My research is focused on mostly shared cultures, so small um, ceramic fragments. So I wanted to understand part of the history of those ceramics. Uh, how better than visiting Maya villages that continue to produce and consume to some extent this Maya, this pottery? Uh, so this research I titled Documenting to Contemporary Maya Pottery Fabrication Uses and Discard. And in this, I'm making good, uh, most uh, emphasis on the discard part. What these people, modern people, do with the pottery that breaks in the process of making it. So I visited Chinautla. Chinautla is roughly located 
really close to Guatemala City, the capital of the country. It hasn't changed that much. You can see, well, in the map, you can see Guatemala City and Chinautla are less than half an hour drive away. So it is close and yet really distant. These are two opposite worlds. You can see a photo of 90, 1880, 1895, and you can see that the same river and even the bridge hasn't changed that much. Chinautla has a lot of issues by itself. Um, it is isolated and yet so close to the city. So there's a lot of social conflict, a lot of racism. You, there's a lot of Maya people living in the village and yet non-Maya, mestizo people. And there are always uh, racial tensions. And in the last uh, decades, uh, it is known in the country that Chinautla, this community is really dangerous. So I was advised when I visited uh, first there by the family that opened their doors to, to me and to do this research to not wander alone, uh, alone to not take pictures uh, because you could be robbed even if your cell phone or camera is one of the cheapest. Uh, it wasn't a good idea. So I have to uh, thank this family, the Guillermo family who opened the doors and they shared some of the photos that they've taken uh, themselves. So as I mentioned, uh, Chinautla and Guatemala City are two opposite realities. Uh, in this slide, you can see, well, two panoramas of Guatemala City. Um, it is surrounded by mountains, and these mountains are rich in clays. And that's why uh, pottery has been a big tradition in this area for thousands of years. And Chinautla, as you can see in these photos, is it lays in abandonment by the country, by the government, by the municipality. The Chinautla River is or was main to the community, and now it is absolutely contaminated. And yet, it is, it is the basin of the river, this river, where people collect the clay, the materials that they use to continue producing pottery. pottery. This town is well known for the pottery tradition, and even from this uh, postal card from the beginnings of the 20th century, you can see this romanization of indigenous people and the pottery that is produced or that was produced in Chinautla. But if you put attention to this image, even back then, you can see that people that is depicted here as Maya or wearing traditional Maya costumes, they are not Maya. The only Maya people that you can see in this photo are in the background and not in the focus of this uh, scene. And that is quite common in Guatemala, even nowadays. So that's why uh, it was my interest in going to this community and trying to record at least some part of what they produced. However, I have to say the timing was terrible because yes, they do produce a lot of pottery still, but they don't do it all year uh, round. They do it only in what we in Guatemala call summer, that is in the first three years of the month, that is the dry season, because from um, May to almost December, it is this rainy season, our winter, and they just don't. They don't collect clays because they cannot dry them on the sun, uh, in the sun, and you cannot find wood to bake them, to cook them. So they don't produce. So pretty much what I did, I just went there and talked to this family that they produce ceramics and try to understand this whole process of production, but especially uh, discarding of the pieces that break in the process. What happened to them? Because in my research, I wanted to see if some of the fragments that I'm dealing with in Copan, ancient ceramics, um, were part of this production um, process and they were just discarded. And I'm just over-analyzing or over-interpreting them. So that's my focus on this uh, short research. Chinautla, not only from these old Republican photos, uh, it has been the center of uh, ceramic production for at least, for some authors, uh, for about the last 2,000 years. So these are two examples of uh, archaeological pre-Hispanic uh, ceramics uh, from Chinautla. The type itself is called uh, Chinautla polychrome because the materials, the techniques, and even the pigments uh, have been uh, found to be locally resourced in Chinautla. Sadly, nowadays, uh, it is only this red and some part of this cream that some people continue to produce the dark, uh, almost uh, um, 
brown color that you see in this um, photo that were created to create the lines is not longer longer able to to be found. And later on, I'm going to talk what happened to uh, these areas of this dark clay. So we're talking about a long uh, standing tradition of pottery in this area that continue well into Hispanic uh, and even modern days. And in this other slide, you can see to the left, there is also a Chinocla polychrome, but from its shapes and decorations, archeologists say, or historians say that these were created during historical times. Spanish had already settled in Chinocla or in the surroundings of Chinocla by then. But you can see this continuity of materials, decoration, techniques, forms, and colors. And then you can see some overlap with the photo to the right. Those are Hispanic uh, ceramics, Hispanic tradition. And yet they were created by Maya peoples. And you can see that some of the patterns continue to be replicated now in porcelain, but the idea continued to be the same. And even nowadays, this tradition continue and the forms and the colors and the idea behind of this uh, pottery continue to be present. So that's why I choose Chinautla. Not only uh, it is really close to the city, but it continued to be really uh, encased in traditions and traditions carried uh, by women. And this transmission is also made by women to other women. And that is uh, in the spice or even um, coexisting with a lot of plastic that is uh, hard now. Now in Chinautla, most of the pottery that is produced in the community is used only as souvenirs in the country. So I don't know how many of you have visited Guatemala, but pretty much chances are that you any ceramic object that you see anywhere in the country, any ceramic souvenir that you see in the country was created in Chinautla. Uh, the process uh, continues to be really traditional. They don't use potter wheels. They source the material in the river basin uh, or in their own fields. But the red color that you see there, that they now have to buy it from private uh, owned land people because there are no indigenous people settled in the 1950s in the area and they now own the land and local people cannot longer uh, uh, go visit, so they need to buy this uh, red color. It is transmitted by women. Uh, I talked to them. I saw this process is all traditional, no potter's wheel, Every, no single piece is identical to the other, and it is just created by hand. And it is in the firing process that you can see that it hasn't changed at all, and pretty much all over a thousand years, there are some archaeological works in this area that has record um, evidences of firing places and that look pretty much the same. So they open in open, they fire the ceramics in open spaces and some of these pieces break. It is the moment in this where these space pieces break. And that's what I wanted to learn in from this research from this fellowship. But people told me, well, if a piece breaks, it hasn't fully cooked yet, so it is not it is not uh, pottery yet. It is just clay, so they just throw it away, and that piece disappears in less than in the next months. So there's no evidence of break um, broken pieces in Chinautla, and that was really illustrating illustrative for me in my research because that gave me the uh, confirmation that. In fact, all the fragments that I have in Copan, ancient Maya ceramics that I analyzed, were in fact complete vessels that survived the whole process. And they were, they broke and the pieces were thrown away, but they were not part of the process of creating them because otherwise they would have not, they wouldn't have survived. Uh, now Chinautla has moving away uh, because even the family that I interviewed for this research they produce these pieces, but they do not consume pottery in their household. They no longer have uh, comales nor pots or anything. Uh, they produce them, but they are uh, taken away from uh, the community and they just produce souvenirs and even modern religious figurines. Now that December is coming, Guatemala continues to be a heavily Catholic Christian uh, country. And you can see Bethlehem's uh, tiny representations of the birth of Jesus. And these are really popular in pretty much every other household in Guatemala. 
So yes, they continue the tradition, the pottery tradition, but the use of this pottery is not longer traditional in Chinautla. This research was difficult by many, uh, many parts. Uh, the roads are terrible, even though they are close to the city. The community is dangerous. And then there is a lot of social uh, conflictivity. Uh, I was advised not to walk alone because I'm a foreigner in that community. I do not speak the language, even though the young generation speaks Spanish. Uh, I do not speak uh, Maya Pocoma. So pretty much I just was in this family's uh, household. Chinautla is at risk because of the reach of the clay sources on this area. It is being mined. They're taking out uh, the clay and the sand. And there's a lot of modern um, non-indigenous people buying the land and mining it for the resources. And also contamination. This is another photo uh, of the Chinautla River. You can see how terrible the situation is. Uh, since it is so close to the city, it is pretty much a dumpster, a city dumpster, and it is terrible. But in this area here, you can see, uh, sorry, the ceramic, uh, the, both sides of the river are rich in ceramics, in, in clay, in this resource. So at the moment that I arrived, people were not pre uh, producing pottery. So all the information that I collected was oral and some photos that they showed me. Um, I just visited. The area, yes, it has this feeling of uh, danger and hostility to some extent because they don't know what were my intentions in the community. But mm, it is amazing that women continue to resist and transmit the knowledge. It is women that organize the community against these mines, against these foreigners that are stealing, they say, the land. And they also, they have some mobilizations. They go to the city and the photo to the right that you see here is a mobilization that happened last year. So potters from Chinautla went to the capital city to show this uh, traditional process. They were opposing the mines um, and they were saying that much of the identity of uh, the Chinautla Basin and the Chinautla area was going to be erased if these mines continued to exist, or continue to be authorized. And this year, another putting another layer of the uh, conflictivity of the in Chinautla, in Guatemala, uh, there were elections these years, and there is a kind of a, coup de, a practical coup d'etat happening. So indigenous communities for the first time in history organized and went and paralyzed the country from the capital city. So they were not eager to talk to an anthropologist that were visiting the community to talk about pottery. They were talking about politics and it was amazing to see. And lots of uh, Maya women from Chinautla went uh, to the capital scenes. Um, it is 48 cantones, an indigenous, um, really big uh, traditional organization who called to paralyze the country because of everything that is happening. So uh, for first time, the first time in history, all of the indigenous communities uh, in the country responded to this calling. So. They left Chinautla and they moved uh, to the city. And up to this day, these uh, mobilizations continue to be taking place. And finally, I want to thank uh, Paulina Guillermo. She opened her uh, doors for me without knowing me. And in this photo, she asked me to uh, take this photo for her and to put it in the presentation. Uh, she's showing me some of the tools that she uses uh, to polish the ceramics that she creates. And for me, as an archaeologist, it's amazing because the tools that she uh, is holding, those are uh, made of jade and these are pre-Hispanic uh, access. And she told me that those have been, have been her family for generations. Uh, her mother got them from their grandmother and now Paulina is going to uh, pass them to one of her granddaughter granddaughters who sadly do not didn't want to learn how to uh, produce uh, pottery. So it seems like it is Paulina the last in a continuous uh, line of potter women in Chinautla that is going to take all, all, all this knowledge with her to uh, the grave. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mauricio. Uh, so we have... Um... Maybe five minutes for Q and A. Uh, yes. 
Yes. You have personal body, you have the interpersonal body. You're talking with all of her, keeping track of everything and the relationship that you become in the midst of her and all of that. And of course, you can teach her about the healthcare and her being a border for that as she needs to identify herself and her. And the Maurice of Hanley, federal sport, and I understand all the. Barriers that you explored, and I, I know you know how far you went considering all of these challenges. I'm just wondering, and this might be a, because I know very little about that, but from the little that I know about what I'm on the lottery, one aspect that always struck me as something that people say is different, I don't even know if it's true or not, is that they're not that connected to images of gods or uh, heroes. It's mostly daily life. And, and, and that's very contrasted with uh, with other five rivers in the region, in Central America, in Mexico. I'm just curious, you know, one, is, is this true? Is that what you perceived? And is it to mention Catholicism entering the conversation? Is, is this something that creates some tension? Is this what this traditional aspect of pottery created by my Indonesian um, great? So before the big fall, <laughs> this is this work with God of images and all that. But it doesn't hear my question. But if the daily lives was an important aspect to that, to what extent is the presence of Catholicism and Catholic images now um, reshaped or reframed that dance or their particularity of where my tradition is part of? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, there, there are many networks in, in between the feminist collectives and movement in different uh, countries of Latin America. Uh, so I, I focus on, on Uruguay because I, I, it's the, the place that I know best. So um, I know the collectives and it was uh, easier to, to, to enter in the field work there. But my idea is to follow up this in other places because there are many experiences for example right now since last year in ecuador and chile uh, there are feminist collectives trying to do in both places uh, feminist 
schools of political education autonomous with so it's not just uh, workshops for example but a systematic um, plan of curriculum of feminist education political education autonomous from uh, academic spaces or other kind of institutional spaces um, in Chile, La Coordinadora Feminista de Santiago, uh, they published a book that collects the experience of organizing the uh, March 8th with experiences from uh, different places, communities, unions. Uh, it's, it's amazing to see how in different places uh, the uh, very small uh, articulations are made to uh, achieve a big mobilization. So I think there are many interesting things there uh, about how they are doing things and reflecting of them and uh, putting them in 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 um, public self publications because I think that shows that the the there is an uh, um, interest in. Uh, that those experiences uh, are not forgotten. And in Argentina also, there are many initiatives that we can trace, but I think that the struggle for the abortion rights and reproductive rights had made also a big amount of knowledge, product, autonomous knowledge production. Uh, so yes, I think there are, it focuses on this idea of knowledge production and systematization. And there are many things that we can uh, research in Latin America, but also to, to, to make the connections between the experiences in different countries. But because I know, for example, that in Chile, the, the, the activist uh, has talked with activists in Uruguay to know how they are doing their publishing uh, Things. So I, I know there are an experience with this uh, share uh, broad between different regions and countries. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, maybe it's not needed. <laughs> um, yeah, interesting. I think, yeah, I think right now I'm like just with the impression of the shock of having encounter I mean not encounter I mean it's like it's there right but like yeah I don't know what to do with it actually but definitely I think it's informing my research in a sense that for example just when you say it when you said it I it, I connected it the these research that I did of the flying rituals like um, it's very interesting that cartography was there influencing me I guess because of the experience of Mapilu because um, I also do like a tiny analysis of how the abject body is not only a body that flies, but a body that moves. So it's like the free movement of a genderized, racial, um, racialized body um, around different cities or they, they would fly to different places. I mean, that's the, that's the story, right? So yeah, I think it's interesting. And then with the affect theory and sensorial, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I need to get more into that. Yeah, I don't know much. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for the, yeah, for the hint, yeah. And briefly, thank you so much for the reference. I will try to find her. Uh, the the critical disabilities feel is so is emerging now and, and I'm excited to, 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 I don't know, contribute a little bit. Uh, I know only one article is there about her her illness and is by Susan Bost, although she's focused on or her diet and how not to because she accumulated even the, the to-go menus. There's plenty of San Francisco area and she was este, uh, using her mom's recipe Amelia Saldua and and it's that that disability article by Susan Bost is focused on her di diet and and also what she says in that article is how we can see that uh, connecting to what you're saying uh, that and Saldua in La Serpiente where she tells about these twenty minutes that she was there in the hospital she formulates alternate ways of being human I think that's also why so such a fertile ground to to look at it as as a post-humanist representation or or piece of work. But I said the link with the disability and post-humanism. Thank you.
Mauricio, you want to say something about Mila's comments? Uh, yeah, uh, sorry. About these uh, feminism uh, networks, um, it is interesting. Um, Guatemala is too polarized. It continues to be this division in between uh, mestizo or non indigenous and indigenous peoples. And in this time that I was, was, I was able to, um, well, see from the side this organization that was born from women, uh, it didn't respond to a feminism per se. It responded to a sense of cultural pertaining and uh, this uh, calling that indigenous uh, uh, leaderships uh, did uh, to defend uh, democracy in the country. Uh, so yes, although in Guatemala there are feminism uh, and a lot of feminism uh, movements, in this case, and especially in Maya communities that traditionally are or tend to be more uh, conservative, uh, yes, women are organized, but they do not uh, respond to feminism the way that we conceive them uh, in our indigenous uh, uh, context. Um, that's my understanding of the situation, although I was there working on a different uh, area. I'm not going to go to my question later. I keep doing it here because you're not live. So, yeah, you can hear me. Please don't think that's not a question. I'm going to do it later. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, so thank you all so much. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for your presentation. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell my yes, to be continued. <laughs> Thank you.